this. All right, let's make a formal introduction for our listeners. Uh, good afternoon, actually. Good morning to you, Robert. Uh, my name is Claudia. I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., uh, from, from the students in Fairfax, but very grateful that Robert Rich accepted our invitation to our show. Robert, welcome back, man. Thank you very much, Claudia. It's a pleasure. Uh, I'm here, man. Quick question for you. When you, you know, reflect of your uh, upbringing, uh, you know, how you describe the role of music in your life? Were music playing the background at home? You know, your, any, any, your dad, your mom had, you know, record. I don't know if you have any brothers or sisters that were playing music when you were a little kid and stuff like that. Absolutely. I mean, my, my father was a jazz musician and loved to listen to, to Bach and Handel and, um, yeah. And West Coast cool school jazz for the most part. So he was really fond of Barney Kessel and Stan Getz and, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, he actually had a chance to play with Vince Guaraldi uh, a couple times, um, the guy who did the Peanuts soundtracks. Yeah. Uh, so there was, he and his best friend would stay up all night on, you know, they'd get together a few times a year and, and have jam sessions where they'd, they'd sing, uh, you know, Beatles songs or Chet Atkins songs and, you know, country and Western and all sorts of stuff. And, and uh, so, yeah, I, I grew up with the idea that music is fun and that music is, is social. Um, mm. And I would sing in church choirs as a kid. And my sister was extremely talented uh, singer. And uh, so the, the whole thing for me was that my own personality didn't really lend myself to the, the social side of music making. I, I was looking at it more as a form of personal expression or as, as an art form to, to reach into places of the unconscious mind. And, and so I somehow considered myself as a failure regarding the kinds of musical standards that people um, compare themselves to, you know, like being able to play in an orchestra or to be able to do good cover music or play blues or something like that. I instead kind of went into my little shell and started building synthesizers and trying to create something that was um, the sound in my head or the sound of, of the strange kind of progressive music that I was listening to, which, you know, I, I had no idea what uh, what psychedelic culture was all about when I was a teenager, but it certainly uh, influenced me as far as its, its art forms and the idea of something, you know, a kind of musical surrealism or something that was outside of the everyday experience, a musical shamanism perhaps. And, and that was definitely the direction that I ended up taking. Yeah. At the time, I suppose we are about the same age. So I, I suppose when in the, you know, the 70s, 80s, I don't know, Tangerine Dream was around, you know, with the, I mean, it's Tangerine Dream still around, but they, they, with the, you know, the, with the other members. The yeah, it was new. Popol Boo was around. They were writing music for Bernard Herzog movie. You knew of, of them? I mean, you knew who they were? Or... I knew the albums from probably around 1977 or so. I think I first heard heard them. Yeah. Uh, Tangerine Dream, Vangelis, uh, probably yeah. were the first craft work, you know, in 75, 6 kind of time frame. I think yeah. I first heard Tangerine Dream when um, Stratosphere came out on, on uh, in the United States on Virgin, and they had a big advertising push. And so I remember seeing an ad for it in a magazine, and I thought it looked cool. So at the time, yeah. I was starting to be aware of electronic music. And I, I think well, my, my first electronic music album was probably either Kraftwerk's um, Trans-Europe Express, or it might have been Vangelis, um, one of his RCA albums, like the Albedo 0 0.39 or something like that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, th it was that era. And, you know, I, I remember hearing... Um, uh, my Goldfield Tubular Bells uh, and, and really wow. find it interesting. And that was around 1974. I think I first heard that. But, but you know, and, and listening to the progressive rock albums that were coming out at the time and everything seemed exciting. I remember mm. being around probably 10, 11, 12 years old when I started becoming aware of, of you know, the, the prog rock that was coming out in the late seven, in the, the early 70s. The, the late era, I think I missed the... I was too young to to catch the that prime year of 1973 when everything was just exploding, you know, with with new ideas. But uh, by 1975 or so, when I started paying attention to new music, you know, it 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 was already branching out into all sorts of really exciting areas of instrumental electronic music, and and that was 
That's, that was what excited me. I would, I would go to Stanford campus near where I lived, and there was a, a bookstore there, the, Stanford, the university bookstore, and some student was the buyer there, and there was a section of import albums that were really cheap. <laughs> they, were, they were underpriced, and um, I used to go through there and just pick up things that had interesting covers or un, you know synthesizers listed on the back. Um, you know, so I remember things like Tim Blake, uh, Crystal Machine. He had, I didn't know anything about Gong at the time, but I, I learned wow. quickly that he had been yeah. the synth player in Gong, and this was his first solo album. And that sort yeah. of thing. And I just thought that there was a, something very exciting and new. And, and I wanted to, to try to make music like that. But I, I was a teenager. I was a, you know, a freshman in high school, and I didn't have any money. Or, yeah. I didn't have any money, so I, you know, I, I would do gardening jobs and paper routes and um, babysitting, you know, anything I could do and build kits. You know, I, I yeah. thought eventually I could have a big setup like Klaus Schultz and sound like that, but didn't realize that the kits I were building, which were this company called Paia in, um, in Oklahoma, that, that it was junk. I mean, it was really, really bad electronics. And so you couldn't keep them in tune and it was full of hum and hiss and, um, <laughs> You know, so I learned a lot about electronics, trying to make it sound good, you know, sticking big capacitors on the power supplies and, and modifying the keyboard so they wouldn't droop with the voltage and stuff like that. But, um, but then, you know, in, in the end, what it did was taught me how to make a unique personal sound because I couldn't play like the, the people with money. I, I didn't have this, uh, you know, this equipment that could allow me to do these ostinato sequencer parts and, and reverbs and delays and everything. So um, I ended up using the electronics to sound more like insects and, you know, strange late night underwater sounds and things. And it was, you know, because I couldn't really keep things in pitch very long, I, I had to find new ways of making sound. So any, any, so you were building your own thing. You didn't have any money, but you, 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 you know, you mentioned Klaus Schulz and the Tangent Dream and Bubble Boo and uh, Blake. You know, uh, very, very good musicians. And any, any pressure? So eventually, you finish high school. Uh, any pressure for you from your parents to say, "Hey, forget about music. We, we know that you like electronic stuff. You know, being a musician is a crazy life. You're not going to make any money. You got good grade." go to school, forget about the nonsense, or, or they... I don't think they had any idea that it was going to be so important to me. I, I was still doing well in school and yeah. went to a good university, and I think my mm -hmm. mom still thought I was going to become a doctor or something, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, like, uh -huh. like anybody who, you know, any dream of a parent. So I... That's I, right. My father was proud of me. He enjoyed the fact that, because he was also a musician. He was also an engineer. I mean, he was doing aerospace microwave engineering, and um, yeah. so I was interested, you know, and I worked for him in the summers, uh, building linear accelerators. And so we all had a, a shared interest in science and in, in music. And I think he understood that the music that I was interested in, he, he didn't understand that music. He thought it was very strange, but he understood <laughs> that getting into jazz Jazz was very strange to people back in the 50s. Absolutely, so, yeah. Uh, I'm sure that his father, who was a classically trained pianist, my grandfather, uh, he, he thought this jazz was, was probably garbage. And so I'm sure that my father understood that there was a progression of experimental mind and that there was possibilities to move into new languages. And he was accepting of that. In fact, he was very proud and expressed that when I became more successful. Um, I mean, we'd have family running jokes of like, you know, are you rich and famous yet? And that kind of thing. But I'm it, not there yet. It was all playful. I mean, it was all fun. Yeah. So eventually, you're right, you finished, you went to Stanford in a very difficult school. You didn't have that much time to, you know, continue with your music and or have enough money to buy new equipment. But Well, actually, I released my first album when I was a freshman at Stanford. Um, in oh, really? Oh. 1982, yeah. Um, and I released two other cassette albums during that time in 83 and 4 and I was starting to perform I, I played my first all night concert in 1982 so oh, I was I was and I, I went to the I, I studied for a year at the computer music center there as well as doing sleep research so I was very active in music and it was becoming 
clear to me that I had a lot more fun doing that than I did doing the research that I was involved in. I mean, the, the sleep research was interesting, and, and I was at a cutting edge in, in a small group of people doing things that were very exciting. Mm. But I, I helped start a company with them in the mid-80s, late 80s, and I became frustrated, and they, I think, became frustrated with me. <laughs> Because because I was trying to do, you know, I was their technician and doing electronics and calibrating these uh, eye movement detectors. And I just got bored with electronics. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to play music. I occasionally got jobs working for medical electronic companies, people who had been grad students when I was an undergraduate at Stanford. Um, and I was doing design, you know, electronic uh, schematics and things. And and I, I when I got hired by uh, Walter Greenleaf it, it is first medical company, medical electronics company. Um, I, I said, I'll, I'll take the job as long as you understand that I will have, that I'll be going on some concert tours occasionally and I might have to take uh, leave without pay, you know, for a few weeks at a time. And that was kind of our arrangement that I worked hourly and and would take leave without pay if I went on tour. So already by, you know, and that was 1990 or 89. And so I was already pretty busy. So you were you living at home after school, or you you took or you you had your own apartment and you? Well, I had an apartment with my girlfriend. We were we were living in a in a in a two bedroom house with one bathroom shared by five people. <laughs> wow! And, and you know, I li living out on the patio, and it, and it would leak. The roof would leak when it rained, and you know that sort of thing. And then we got an apartment, um, and. Uh, we broke up, but I stayed in Palo Alto for a little while. I, I had a loft above a clothing store, where, which, which was my first studio. And I wasn't supposed to sleep in it, but I sometimes would sneak up there and sleep in there. Um, uh, it was, I was supposed to work all night there and, and then go somewhere else to sleep during the day because was, there was a clothing store that was busy in the daytime up downstairs below my loft. Uh, but that was my first recording studio. That was in 1985. And yeah. um, so, but no, after what happened then is that my parents were living at my grandparents' place and they wanted to move away and sell it in 1987. And so I moved back to be the caretaker for the property while it was up for sale. And so I did move back home, but my parents moved away. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. So, so after I, basically I truly moved out um, of home after leaving for college. And, um, and it was funny because my parents actually, I, I grew up just a few miles from Stanford university. So I, pretended that I was far away. I would go visit them, you know, every couple of weeks, just like it was, it was a holiday or something, but I, I could ride my bike there. Um, yeah. But we pretended that I was far, far away. And uh, then after, after they moved away, I took care of this place for a year or so. And that's when I met Dixie, actually. Um, Your wife, yeah. Yeah, and we've been together for 36 years now, I guess. Oh, amazing, man. It... Uh... People, people in general, they don't have patience, man. They, I don't know. I've been with my wife for what twenty two years, and people give up. I think they don't want to grow up, or whatever. You know, marriages of twenty, thirty, forty years that are rare nowadays. You know, I don't well, know. What you find interesting is that, and and our parents would tell us these things, and we wouldn't really understand it. But, but as we grow older, the relationships change, and we grow up and become more mature and more forgiving and more oh, understanding. Yeah. Yeah. And, and man, I don't know why she put up with me in the early times of our relationship because I was a bit strong-headed and sometimes difficult. So I, I, I'm amazed that we've made it this long. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good, man. Yeah, same here, man. I, somebody, someone, somebody will say black, the other say white, and you need to arrive with gray. It's always give and take. And, of course, it's love and... Uh, conversation and you know to make a, a couple uh to stay together and so forth so you work you you're you're still the time where releasing new music releasing new music still you couldn't make a living and and in general right if you if you are good uh as, as a pop or rock back rock band you you make very good money but in the kind of music that you you like and i i like and you play you know, it wasn't a lot of money that could be made, right? You know, I don't know, was, 50, 50 people uh, would go to a show or a cafe or whatever. 
you know, not right. for the first six or eight years for me. I, I, I yeah. would put money into it. I actually broke even often with releases and, and yes. customers would spend money. I, I, yeah. I would be if I'd get 10 people to show up for concerts because nobody knew who I was. Mm -hmm. But I started releasing albums in Europe and those paid for themselves. Um, That's good. Uh, and Hans Falberg in uh, Sweden, Hans Falberg started a company called Multimood. And I was the first person he ever released as a cassette um, when it was still called Psych Out Productions in 1985. Yeah. And, uh, because he was an early fan of my cassette releases. And then he put out a, a vinyl record in 1987 called Numina. That got some notice in Europe. And then I worked on another album that I couldn't get sold, a Geometry. And then worked on Rainforest uh, in the first house that Dixie and I lived in. And that did very well. I sold 50,000 copies of that in the first year. And so at that point, wow, wow. Uh, and, and that was on a label that was on Hearts of Space. And I had a, a ally with Stephen Hill at Hearts of Space who was promoting work that he thought was important. And he was releasing some of it, some of it on his record label. And um, it was the second best selling album on Hearts of Space for several years. And that's when I started feeling like I was getting too busy making music to actually have a day job. So I still had a day job for another two or three years until around 1993, I think. And that time I had two albums with Steve Roach, another two or three solo albums, and I was full time and, and I was just too busy. Um, and Dixie had a job. We were paying rent and, you know, but actually by that time we, we bought a house. So we were paying mortgage and paying a lot of mortgage. And, um, uh, it just uh, just kept on working, you know. Good for you, man. Good for you. So, you know, at the time, maybe you, you, your parents were happy, your grandpa, man, this little kid that, you know, used to like weird music in, in his oh, room now. I don't, think they, really making, making I don't a think they really understood what I was doing. They didn't really <laughs> care for it. And as far as my, my uh, I mean, most of my grandparents were dead by then, but I uh, see. certainly would have preferred that I went into uh, medicine like two of my other grandparents had. Um, my, yeah. There was a doctor on either side of my parents' family. My father's yeah. mother and my mother's father were both doctors. Mm. And, you know, my, my father was a scientist. And this, this was all sort of expected, that you go into academics or you yeah. go into science or into, uh, into medicine or something that's important that people perceived as being useful or or respectful and yeah. i don't think my mother ever thought that music was respectable and it was it was something she always tolerated because it's who i was and she would accept who i was but she, and, and she was proud that i was good at it but mm. but otherwise it wasn't what she wished i was doing <laughs> <laughs> man tell me about it. i'm the black sheep of the family man i i told you before when we met um, i came from a, a family of uh a lot of academics and uh, schooling was the only way to make it, and you need to be good at the top of your class. And, top. and I was, you know, a crazy kid, man, who we was chasing girls to try to drink beer when I was 17, 18 in South America. So I got serious, very serious when I came to the United States to study. I got lucky on the way, and yeah. here I am. But uh, but music was very important to me. I told you before, my, my dad had um, a lot of music, uh, jazz, uh, all jazz. Uh, and then tango for Argentina. So uh, he used to tell me that um, he put a lot of records, 78 RPM, and, you know, and he was, uh, you know, he told me he was showing me a lot of different things. And then when I was 14, I sort of discovered rock and roll. You know, the Tangerine Dream. I remember my first three album. It was a P Genesis, a, uh, a Pandemini album, and a Tangerine Dream. And I knew back then, man, I really like music. I'm not going to play music. I'm not going to be a musician. I don't know how to read music, but I want to go to concerts and uh, listen to a lot of music. That was before the internet, right? Obviously, we didn't have cell phone. So you would buy vinyl, but you didn't know if the band will play. And, you know, yeah, you learned buy... about music by, by flipping through records in the record store. That's, that's right. I look at the picture and stuff like that. And this, <laughs> this yeah, record on. Yeah, it's funny, it's, I think to this day, I still struggle with with these senses of, of in, how to put it, of, of, of not having realized my full potential. And I probably um, push myself 
intellectually with my own musical questions so that I feel like I'm at least moving forward with, with, with ideas. And, and I think for me, the idea of um, studying ideas with each album, that, that each album is a set of questions or is a set of, of philosophical ex explorations. And mm -hmm. that idea still um, is, is very strong with me. There, there has, for me to stay interested, there has to be an intellectual component to the music as well as an emotional and a spiritual or a shamanic component to the music. Um, I, I want it to operate on all of these different levels. And so for me, I need to do research and come up with fresh approaches before I become inspired to, to work on a new album. And each time, and, and as, as I get older and, and I you know, try to avoid falling back on all my same habits, this becomes even more the case where each time I, I, I do a lot of reading in between albums and I do a lot of thinking about what, what needs to be said for me and my life in, in the world, you know. And the last few albums were very much along these lines since the pandemic you know, I, I was the the, the, um, the album offering to the morning fog was pretty much because people had requested something that was more therapeutic to them than some of the recent things I had done. But um, but then Neurogenesis was an album that came directly out of out of an intense lucid dream that I had about consciousness and about the 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 boundaries between uh, skin and the universe. You know, shall we say about the the, the dissolvability, perhaps, of, of sentience or mind, um, the idea that, that there could be sentient systems that are far larger or slower or faster than we can perceive. Um, and so that was definitely a philosophical excursion, and the sound had to somehow fit those ideas. And then the album uh, uh, Traveler's Cloth came from a lot of reading of... of uh, uh, classic Tang Dynasty Chinese poetry and studying Chan and, and Taoist philosophy. In, in particular, I found the story of, of this one poet, Tu Fu, to be very profound and very, very emotional because his life was, was so difficult and yet his poetry was so profound. And, and this was right at this time when the pandemic was going on and my wife and I were, were looking at moving out of Silicon Valley and finding ourselves in, in a state of some comfort, actually, in a, for the first time in my life, a state of some financial comfort. And finding myself very, very distrustful of that um, because I, I find that when I'm thinking things are comfortable, that's when I get lazy and that's when things go wrong. Um, but it's not because of some magical thinking that I'm causing it. It's actually because I think the more we realize the fragile nature of life, the more we pay attention. And for me, the idea of paying attention is, is critical and being awake in the world, being alive to this moment. So this idea that so, so Tufu, his own life, was one where he had, he had grown up in, in a royal family, basically. He was great grandson to the Tang Dynasty Emperor, and he was advisor to the court, and, you know, very much in in, in the thick of, of political activity in Xi'an around uh, 720, you know, 700 AD in, in China. And there was massive invasion from the north and from the east, uh, from Tibet and from uh, Mongolia, so the the empire became one that was at war constantly. And then there was a civil war. So a, a lot of internal unrest. They, they lost, they lost the town of Xi'an and the, the emperor had to run away. And so everybody who was part of that system, who was part of the Royal family had a price on their head and they had to run and hide for years and years. And so Tufu spent most of his life wandering with his family through the river valleys of central China, um, trying to find a way to stay alive uh, in extreme poverty and living from time to time in uh, Buddhist uh, retreats up in the mountains um, to, uh, to hide from war and from, from uh, assassins and things. And so 
he became an adept poet and one of the great poets in, in Chinese history. All of this in an extremely disrupted life, a life that was constantly in, in fear of death and, in, and with a lot of uh, poor health also. And I found that to be very profound. Um, and I found his poetry to be extremely blunt and fresh and human and sometimes really angry and really political and sometimes extremely gentle and very beautiful, but always surprisingly human. And so when people think of this academic process of studying poetry or of like, you know, trying to understand what something means and thinking about it and trying to dive into, you know, these ideas that seem very intellectual and you'd read his poetry and it would make you laugh or it would make you angry or cry. And you'd feel like this is, it's bluntly human. And it was so incredibly refreshing. So I, I found that to be really inspiring. And, and so that, that's the sort of thing that pushes me forward. Uh, it's beautiful. I was uh, listening to you, your last three records. I was, I was, I was preparing questions for the interview and travel cloth is, is, is you know, I, I, it really resonated with me, man. It's very, very good, man. It's <laughs> very, very good. Very good. So you, so instead of me, right? If I, I'm not a musician, but if I were a musician, I will sit in front of a keyboard and a piano, synthesize or whatever, and write something, and then see where it will fit. But you kind of go the other way around. You look at an interesting problem in the world or in poetry or literature. And, and from there, right, you have like a concept, right? And then from there, you kind of write the music. But how how do you pick the next album that you want to work? <laughs> I mean, you go to a library and say, man, I'm, I have, you, you mentioned, you know, a lucid dream, right? Or you mentioned... It, I, I just said, it, it picks me is what happens, basically. I, I keep myself open and, and I find myself yeah. exploring. And, and then something starts grabbing me and working its way inside. Um, it starts, <laughs> you know, it's almost like a parasite. I, I, I use a metaphor that it's, uh, that, that, well, there's a, a wonderful short story by Jorge Luis Borges, uh, uh, mm. Circular Ruins. Uh, you being Argentinian probably remember uh, Borges. And, uh, yeah, of course. Um, the Circular Ruins is about a, uh, a, a wizard or a magician who, who feels this urge to, to create a new human. And mm. he goes into the forest and um, in a place where there's a, an old ruin and he sleeps and sleeps and sleeps and starts dreaming and slowly builds in his dream uh, his own child. Uh, and in the dream, this child basically comes out of him and runs out into the woods and there's a huge fire that burns everything down and, and the, the magician dies in this fire. And to me, what Borges is doing is creating a metaphor for the creative act. Mm. Um, partially the idea of, of something growing inside of you and becoming a completely separate thing. And that's what each album starts as. It starts as a sort of homunculus, a, uh, a, a little person inside. And it, it creates its own set of rules, its own landscape, its own um, textures, tactile. I, I did an album five years ago called Tactile Ground, which was about tactile synesthesia. Uh, of course, people know synesthesia is when you have senses that cross over in their modalities. People will see sound or, or you know, hear, hear smells or something like that. And, and I've learned over the many years that, that I have a kind of synesthesia, which I call tactile synesthesia. I'm a mastering engineer working on sound and I feel the sound on my skin. Um, it, you know, sound has texture, it has cold and wet and, and shiny, or, you know, it's, it's smooth or oily. Um, and so that album was basically almost like Scriabin, <clears throat> almost like Scriabin. It was a sort of orchestra of, of tactile synesthesia. So, you know, this idea of this multimodal thing, it could be sound, it could be texture, it could be light, color, forming inside your imagination as a self-independent entity, as a, as a, you know, as a golem, as it were, as like, like the old um, story of the golem, the, the rabbi who uh, in an act of, of um, 
impetuousness or or arrogance uh, you know learns the secret name of god and and whispers it into a lump of clay and this boy jumps up out of the clay and and makes all sorts of trouble right um because of the the hubris of of the idea of knowing the breath of god so so i think all of these stories like the circular ruins are hidden you know that they're, they're actually telling people the secret of the creative process they're they're a, a cookbook really and the idea for me is to go inside to to um hibernate or to to what i call spelunking you know like like going cave exploring into my own memories into my own imagination yeah. and finding in these caverns of memory finding things that that are alive and have their own energy they have their own self-direction and those choose me they become the next direction i believe i am I'm glad that I'm recording that because uh, it's very deep. They said what you're saying. By the way, Jorge Luis Borges uh, is in literary circles. Uh, it's one of the, you know, major injustices that he didn't win the Nobel Prize. Actually, he for Argentina. Uh, but then again, there are so many great writers for Latin America that then if, if every every country. Uh, someone from South America were to win the Nobel Prize, there would be injustice for all the other country. But he's he's way up there with all the all the other guys. What about Gabriel Garcia Marquez? Did he win a Nobel? Uh, 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 Gabriel Garcia Marquez, yes, he's from Colombia, right? So yeah. I'm, I'm from I'm from Chile. I'm right next to Argentina. So uh -huh. Jorge Luis Borges never won the Nobel Prize from Chile. You have Allende uh, in Chile. Uh, right. Uh, but so two people from, from Chile won the Nobel Prize. And um And um, in Colombia and Mexico, and so they were there a lot of writing. It's kind of weird because um, in 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 Chile, Chile has won two Nobel prizes, and uh, and it's one of the worst spoken Spanish. I mean, the way that they speak in Spanish in Chile is very bad. But and then again, have won not just Nobel prizes, but in in Spain, they have. Uh, a yearly literary award for the best Latin American Chile have won many, many times. And then again, you know, the way that the Chile, they speak Spanish and the way they pronounce the word is very, very bad, you know. <laughs> in, in Bogota, Colombia, right? Bogota, Colombia, of course, uh, Garcia Marquez um, won the Nobel Prize in literature and uh, they speak the very, very, very good Spanish. So if you want to learn the language, I recommend <laughs> young, young kids out there to I think the, the reason the reason why he didn't get so yeah. many credits is that he didn't write novels. Um, yeah, obviously, yeah. And you know his uh, his work was so concise and so precise as well. Mm. As a person who studied Spanish, I found him very easy to read um, mm. because his, his use of language was so much like the Latin. It was it was very very pure and very straightforward. A beautiful, beautiful writer. But, um, mm. but yeah, so for me, those metaphors explain a lot about why I work slowly. Um, and, you know, I work very differently, for example, from Steve Roach, who, you know, we just played a concert a month ago. That's uh, right. Yeah. Two weeks ago. And, um, and I respect him deeply. He's a very good friend, lifetime friend. And we have a very, very different way of working. He is very much um, in the flow of, of each moment creating a sound that could exist forever, like this repeating, sequencing, cyclic, trance inducing thing and, and he doesn't think so much in terms of of compositional structure as much as um, creating things in motion creating things that are in the present and f for me it's it, it couldn't be much more different because i i sit and sort of structure things into stories or into um, you know sculptures it's a much more slow and You know, I, I can improvise as well, but and when I improvise, I do better when I'm within somebody else's framework, within a sort of um, support role. And so that's what I do with Steve, is basically um, try to enter myself into his framework as a support role to, to strengthen everything, uh, to create a sense of perhaps melody or a, a, th a thread that moves things forward which can pull at what he does because he's often 
very much um, in the present as, as, a, as a sort of a boiling pot of, of energy. And for me, to, to run a thread through that, to tell a story through this steam of bubbling energy is, is an interesting puzzle. But, but it is a, a different process. And, and I find these differences to be interesting. I, I, I think with Steve and me, with this long friendship, I think we're both recognizing that as we get older, time is getting shorter to achieve certain continuities, shall we say, to, to make things come full circle and to, to realize our friendships more in, um, in a complete way, again, creatively. I, I had the opportunity to, to uh, interview, uh, interview him in, uh, last month in December, uh, around the time before. I don't remember if it was before or after you guys played together, but he's a very nice person, very decent human being. And of course, he's very prolific, you know. Steve Roche can release an album every five weeks. You do one a year, and there's yeah, a, a people yeah. in between, you know. So there's no 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 pressure. But he's he's a very good person, and of course, his music is very good. But the way you perceive music and you go through yours, you 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 give you give a good impression. But you know, I'm thinking about music and senses. The way you sense music, and what does it mean to be a human being, though? Uh, because you the way you the way that i don't know the music has selected you pick you right find you you sense music very different that that 99 percent of the world right so what does it mean to be a human for me okay i i like jazz i like rock I, electronic music i'm very lucky that i have a well-paying job and here where I live in the border with Virginia, with Maryland, I want you to every band come this way. So I'm able to see, uh, I don't know, 50, 60 shows a year. So I'm very lucky. I see everybody and with the podcast now interviewing people that, that, you know, I never, I never thought that they will get back to me. And I go to a concert. I enjoy it. I'm not a musician. I don't know how to read music, but give me music has given me so much satisfaction for you. It's, it's different, right? So what does it mean? For you, what does it mean to be a human? The way you sense the world, or or the way you f music uh, find you, and so so forth. I think lately, my my dominant sense of existence has been one of gratitude. Yeah, I think I think a sense of of thankfulness. Yeah, I also have an unusual tendency to to dethrone the importance of humanity in exchange for an appreciation of the network of existence that we have around us, the other animals, the other sentient life mm -hmm. and all things. I've been slowly dissolving my, my humanism and slowly accepting a place um, as, as equals and friends among the animals near me and the ideas in, in neurogenesis are not unlike this, too, the idea of sentient life. Um, here, where, where we live now, in Carmel, in Monterey Peninsula, there was a famous poet named Robinson Jeffers, who was writing about 100 years ago, and he built a house by hand, it starting in 1918, out on the coast. And Robinson Jeffers referred to himself as an anti-humanist. He, or inhumanist, I think was the word he used. Um, and his poetry placed human aspirations and human hopes and human act activity into a context of a world that just did not care, a world that was quite casual about destroying us, and a world that looked at us and laughed. And I find that to be... In part, his his time was one of extreme optimism and humanism. It was the Victorian era. It was the Industrial Age. We now have a, a, a late capitalism sense of despair, perhaps, with with the idea of climate change and the idea of population growth and 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 after two world wars, watching what people can do to each other, genocides and everything, and and it's very easy to despair about the future of humanity. 
And I think about Robinson Jeffers, and I also think a lot about um, the studies that I've had with Sufism and with Taoism, about our role as, as spiritual beings, our role as sentient beings.